Today's program, Career Pathways in Construction Management, is going to, going to give you an opportunity to take a look at the construction field actually on the other side of the trades. Uh, here where we have the, the blueprints being uh, utilized to help construct and build different types of buildings and highways and uh, I guess you might even look into uh, the infrastructure of the sewer systems and looking above the ground with regards to power and of course many alternative uh, type energies that are now being promoted throughout uh, the country and of course around the world. Just to let you students know, this is an interactive class, which means we want you to ask questions. So when it's time for questions, I will call upon each of the schools. We'll probably start off by taking two questions from each of the schools. Please be close to a microphone. Students, we'd like to have you introduce yourself with your first name, ask your question, and then place your microphone back on mute. By doing that, that will keep your sight on our monitor, and our panelists will be able to address your questions. And we'll be doing that probably in about 15 minutes or so. I'd like to now introduce uh, the three panelists who are with us today uh, with various uh, experiences in construction and uh, also in, in, in schooling. And it's very important that you uh, keep this in mind that we have three people here uh, who have uh, made the dec decision uh, to get higher education, to become involved in higher education, to promote uh, their careers in the area of construction. And we'll talk more about that as we move through our program. So to uh, my immediate uh, right here, from Dunlap Johnson, is uh, Grant Raymond. Uh, Grant is actually the project manager uh, with the firm, which is a local firm here in Northeast Ohio. He's been with them for uh, approximately 10 years. He's a graduate from Westerville North High School, which is actually located down in Columbus, Ohio, and a, a graduate from Bowling Green State University, which is located in Western Ohio. So Grant's been here, there, and everywhere uh, with a uh, degree in architectural design and also uh, construction management. He also has an MBA from Baldwin Wallace College, which is now known as Baldwin Wallace University. And Grant, thank you for joining us. Also with us is uh, Tassiana Stigel. Tassiana is uh, the young lady here at this table and uh, actually still in school. She is an urban study student at Cleveland State University, a uh, graduate from Jane Addams uh, High School here in uh, the greater Cleveland area, and actually was in computer programming uh, before she moved on into urban studies at uh, Cleveland State. And we'll hear more about Tassiana's uh, move to urban studies shortly. And last but not least, we have with us uh, another project manager, and that is Orlando Taylor, who is uh, working with Turner Construction, which again is a very well-known local, statewide, and actually an uh, international construction firm. He's been 15 years uh, with Turner Construction, and uh, again has a, a degree from the University of uh, Cincinnati, and also has an extensive background in construction. Uh, construction work uh, based upon uh, his experiences as a, a, a college student involved in a co-op program, as uh, the same here with uh, Grant, and we'll talk more about the co-op also. Gentlemen and lady, to begin with, okay, let's uh, maybe, can we come up with, first of all, maybe a, a definition of uh, what our program's all about? It's careers in project management. So what actually is project management in the construction business? Here we go. I tell people, because when they ask me this question, I say I facilitate the build. That's a great question. Here we go. It's making everybody play nice in the sandbox when I go out to, into the field. So there's the owner, there's the architect, there's the engineers, there's the contractors, and everybody has a responsibility. However, if they could do it all by themselves, then I wouldn't have a job. Because ultimately, they're as you hand off your responsibility or what you've done to the next person who's supposed to then take that and do their job, there's gaps. So I fill in the gaps, pretty much what it is. You are coordinating, yes. you're managing. Yes. yes. I think it's the management process taking a budget, a set of construction plans, and a time frame, and get it, taking that from that basic point to a finished building 
and all of the sandbox quarrels in between. It's managing all of the issues, constraints, um, schedules, and conflicts to get to the finished product. Okay, very good. Now, let's go back to each of you and find out what brought you into uh, this project management, this construction career. And you're on camera, Grant, so uh, what's your story? Well, I went into the military so I could uh, afford college. Uh, and when I got out, I went to Bowling Green State University. Uh, I thought I wanted to be an architect. Uh, I was taking architectural design, but they also had, for one more semester, a dual major with construction management. Why not? Uh, when I got out, I had all these ideas that I was going to be an architect. And I started at a local firm in Cleveland, and I quickly realized it was not for me. It is not... Uh, the, the what a lot of people perceive, uh, you know, d coming up with your own designs and having them come to fruition. Um, really, the owner of the architect firm comes up with the designs and you draw them. Um, so I went to construction management and I love it. Uh, I went to a local uh, general contractor and started project management um, and found out that the whole process is, is really interesting and it's a good mix of office work and field work. And it's exciting every day. There's hardships, but it's exciting. Very good. And Tassiana, now you are a student in urban studies and, uh, again, leaning towards construction management. What uh, brought you out of Jane Adams in computer programming to uh, where you are today? Well, I always had an interest in technology, but in a background of technology, I always had an uh, interest in community involvement and development. So throughout elementary and high school, I sort of had the opportunity to tap into working in, or helping the mayor's office because my auntie would bring work home. So I can remember stuffing envelopes and having, having to, you know, knock on doors. So then as I went through my high school career, did the computer program and still love, you know, the software side of um, technology. But then I said, what do I really want to do? And I put all my interests together and came up with urban planning. And as an urban planner, you work with construction because in a lot of situations we play the owner's rep and we come to the table with these crazy and fun ideas and we look to the turners and dial up and we say, hey, can you put this together at an efficient pace and this is all the money we have and depending on if this is a private or public sector. We want them to make magic happen just so we can make people happy. And our program is sponsored by the Construction Employers Association. How have you worked with uh, that organization? Okay. The Construction Employers Association, we represent contractors because contractors, there's two sides to contracting, and Grant can probably speak to this. There's a public and, uh, not, not, sorry, union and non-union side, and they're both uniquely different and Grant yeah. can speak to that a little bit, the different size. Oh, you, you want me to do that now? Sure. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, actually, the first contractor I went to go work for is non-union, a uh, very large company, and I was there for six years. Um, and when I think of union, non-union in the commercial industry, uh, I think of, you know, if I'm going to, if I was the owner, I'm going to build a strip mall, um, I'm going to go non-union. It's not... You know, the building isn't the Taj Mahal, um, and why spend a little extra money to have it built union? But if I'm going to build a large facility or a school, something that's going to be long-lasting or intricate, then honestly, my 10 years with the union trades, I would definitely, as an owner, I would, I would go union. Uh, it's not, what really cost isn't on bid day, it's at the end of the job. And the union trades, just on average, are better skilled and they're going to see problems before they're hanging in the air. Um, and so the, the union brings a lot of benefits that throughout the, throughout the course of a project really actually bring down the cost of a project. And then you're left with a better facility in the end. And, and that's why the CEA started back in 1916. There was a group of guys in that early time. And they said, well, we want to represent contractors and we want to ensure that anything that's built is built with quality and can last and that's important as you see Grant explain. Very good thank you. Orlando what led you into uh, 
the project management. You went down to the University of Cincinnati. You knew that they had the program you wanted to be involved in. And how'd you, how'd you get there? Um, well, as I said in our earlier conversation, that I started off in electrical engineering because I had an Atari and I played with computers. And I said, oh, okay, electrical engineering. And then I found out in school that is not what it is at all. So I hated it. So then I had a friend who was actually uh, doing uh, construction. He was actually working for Turner. He invited me to a picnic. They got me a summer internship working for a concrete company, and I loved it. I mean, it was the greatest summer I ever had, and I learned um, the country top 20. I could name every artist and song because I rode around in a pickup truck with this guy uh, doing jobs from state to state. Uh, so then I changed my major to construction management, uh, got some internships or co-ops with Turner, uh, and moved on from there. And now I've been working for Turner for 15 years in construction. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate you all being here. Uh, let's go back to uh, the responsibilities of a, uh, a project manager. We mentioned earlier uh, about working with the uh, architect and, and working with the owner uh, and, in a sense, managing or coordinating uh, the products being here, uh, the uh, are you? Are you, I, I don't get ahead of myself. But are you in charge of helping put together subcontractors? Does that become one of your responsibilities? And if so, uh, how do you go about that process? Well, as a project manager, and companies are a little different, uh, but as a project manager, when a company lands a project, uh, there's an estimate. And that estimate is compiled of all different numbers, so much money for carpet, so much money for masonry, so much money for, for concrete. And those estimates are based off of uh, quotations from subcontractors. And a lot of times the project manager will be responsible to negotiate that final contract. You are trying to negotiate with the concrete contractor not just the best price you can get, but also to make sure they have all the scope of work. Getting the best price will mean nothing if you miss $15,000 worth of mechanical pads and down the road um, you may have saved $10,000 in your negotiation, but you spent fifteen dollars later. Uh, that, that really did you no good. Um, so that's, that's a very beginning fundamental um, item that a project manager has to handle at the beginning of a project is setting up what I call loading up your toolbox, getting all the contracts and trying to cover all the scope that's on those drawings. So as the project unfolds, your superintendent out in the field who is calling and organizing, hey, concrete guy, I need you to come out here, that he doesn't pick up the phone and say, I need you to come out here and do these mechanical pads and gets the answer of, that's not in my contract. Um, if you can, if you do your job and are diligent up front, and you can capture all the scope, you're going to have very few phone calls like that to deal with down the road. And and can I ask, and either any of you, uh, please take this. How do you develop uh, that set of skills? Now, you're talking about experience, okay? Yeah. Uh, have all three of you the, had the opportunity to work with experienced people to again learn on the job uh, to pick up that information uh, to know in a sense right from wrong a uh, warp two by four versus uh, you know uh, the one that you want to uh, have using as a stud etc cetera, etc cetera? I you know I mean I, you already okay I I from from my experience when I hired into my first position as a I hired as assistant project manager and I went door to door to all the active project managers what can I help you with uh, and I learned how to do punch lists, and I learned how to do submittals, uh, and I paid attention to how they did things. Um, and eventually, you'll be given your, your first project, and it's kind of scary, no matter how big the contract is, because now all of a sudden, you're responsible for this much money, whether it be a half a million or a million dollars, but you're responsible to, for this much money and to build this building and to have money left over when you're done. Um, John, I forgot the question. <laughs> for the experience? Oh, the experience. Yeah, I'm sorry, John. So so you gain experience that way by, by just basically jumping in the water and doing it. Uh, the other big thing that I have found is a good project manager is able to go out on the site. Yes, you are the leader of a project, 
but you have to listen to people. And there are tradespeople out there that will know, will know far more on how to frame a wall than I'll ever know. And when there's an issue, you have to be wise to listen to them, to not think you know everything, because you don't, to listen to them, but then also be creative to help overcome these problems. Um, and a lot, and also be wise that everything that everybody tells you may be in their best interest, but not in your own. So don't be afraid to listen to that carpenter on site who says, this is the only way to do this, and it's going to cost $10,000. Okay, I listened to you. Now pick up another phone call. You have relationships with other carpenters who may not be on that job and pick up a phone call. Hey, I have this problem. And you may find other solutions um, and just keep working the problem until you come up with a better solution. Maybe maybe they're right. Maybe that is the only way to do it and it is going to cost $10,000. Maybe you find another way it costs five. Maybe you find out the guy just doesn't want to do it the hard way and you know, and you've got to make them do it the hard way and it costs you nothing. Um, so that that's, you know, and it's just a matter of time. To work the the experience and, and the communications yeah. and, uh, you know, again, having those contacts, building that file of people that you can trust yeah. and, and yeah. listen to. You mentioned being on a field, uh, out in the field. And Orlando, let me come uh, to you with that. How much time do you actually spend out in the field? And is that uh, a necessity of your job? Hmm. Um, I would say yes, I, just a 50-50 split. Um, I always need to go to the site, and depending on who the GC is, the complexity of the project, and, and, and then how involved an owner is determines how much I need to be in the field. Some jobs it requires more just because of um, the interaction. Uh, when we go through our meeting minutes, one of the uh, line items is interaction with the public. We call it community. And it seems odd to the contractor why we talk about it and why it's first, but if we're next to a school or we're next to a busy shopping area, how you set up the job site and how you have the fence and how you have trucks waiting and therefore you're blocking people from doing their day-to-day -day activities gives a phone call to the owner who then in turn gives a phone call to me who in turn gives a phone call to you. So there's always managing those relationships and just understanding. If we're doing a uh, project and you're trying to build a building, you wreck the building in the wintertime. If that's when the owner had the money, and that's when they said go, so you, you do it. Everybody would always like to start a project in um, April, April, yeah. right? Just after it rains, you're fresh, your ground's good, it's soft enough to dig, you can go to town. You're working, you're erecting your structures in the, in the dry uh, June, July, August. You're putting your pavement, September, beautiful. Can't always do that. happen that way. Right, right. So you, you have to understand. It depends on complexity, where you're at, what type of project it is, um, the Medmark you worked on, which is cross streets, it's going year round. So you're always adjusting. And there's always people out there almost 24 hours a day, actually 24 hours a day, just because it demands your attention and you to be there. And uh, all three of you, I've worked through a, uh, a co-op program. And before we take questions, how about explaining uh, what the co-op program is and the advantages to a co-op program? Tassiana, you want to get started with that? I'll start with that question. A co-op is essential to any career you know, even outside construction, because you get an inside look on what your career, your career would be like and what's the day-to-day -day items. Um, when I had the opportunity to intern with Turner Construction, it was pretty interesting because you had so many moving parts and pieces, and you had a project manager and an executive project manager, and they both work together, and they have to hold together this team, but also, besides the management team, they also have to look over trades uh, people in the field and when you sit in the office and there's 10 floors above the f site is is interesting because they're always looking to see what you, what's going on in the field are we doing this right and there was an interesting situ situation where there was a couple because there was a hole that was a couple hundred feet and there was a gas leak of, of some sort and they had to quick think. They had to quick, uh, quickly think on their feet. What will, what will they do? So they had to call in a diver to go down and shut this veil, and that was a solution that probably someone that wouldn't have think of if it didn't happen on another site. So that's the type of experience a co-op gives you, and it's little things like that you may learn that you may have to use on the site you may lead in the future. And how does a co-op program actually work then? Uh, going to, let's say, a four-year university, uh, how does that work for anyone? 
can take that. Yeah. Um, at the University of Cincinnati, uh, you start off your freshman year, and when I was in, we were on quarters. So your first three quarters was all school, some people, and then come summer, which is the fourth quarter, you can elect to either go to school, take a break, or start your co-op. And then you alternate schoolwork, 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 until your senior year where you're back in school for three quarters straight. In the co-op uh, situation, is there a, a good chance that you may be employed by one of those companies that you work for during the, uh, yeah. the semester? Yes, I ended up um, actually being offered to work, even though I chose not to, to continue to work during school on the um, project that I was on, the Paul Brown Stadium. Oh, very good. Yes. Super. Well, I think we've given some general background here. Let's open up for some questions and see what the kids uh, are interested in, in hearing about right now. So, uh, uh, 12 Corners, uh, we have you on our monitor right now. Number one, I'd like you to unmute uh, your monitor, or I'm sorry, your, your microphone. And you know what? We'd like to know where you guys are located because I know you're, I believe you're outside the state of Ohio, if I'm not mistaken, uh, somewhere maybe in New York State. Um, okay, um, hello, my name is Adina Goldstein, and we are in Rochester, New York, the town of Brighton at 12 Corners Middle School. And my question for you guys is, what happens if a homeowner would like something done of a, a very specific way, but in reality it's just not possible? Yeah. All right. Um, what you just stated is actually common. You know, it, it's the vision of the person with the money uh, wanting something that uh, it's just not doable. So what you would do as a contractor, and hopefully you, you have enough experience and, and you're able to actually communicate to the person and show them options um, that they would want. Like, for example, they may want to build something that's against code. Like, you, you just you can't physically do it per the city. Or you're trying to put something that your structure won't support. So you just have to have options, and you would present those to the person. What about uh, people uh, looking towards uh, the cost factor and, again, the quality factor? Uh, is it your responsibility to, in a sense, keep the, the cost down and still have a, a, a quality item installed? Or do you um, mix and match as best you can to, to in a sense, satisfy uh, the owner? I would say yes. And I mean, as, as a good contractor, and Grant, you'll agree yeah. with this, you always want to present the owner with the best option or the best bang for their buck. So you don't have to put terrazzo floor everywhere, even though it lasts forever. But if you're only going to be in a building for 15 years, why do you put in a 50 and 40 year product? That's, that's, that doesn't make any sense. There are alternative solutions you can use. Now, we're not saying put carpet everywhere, which hides blemishes, but, you know, there's there's a happy medium that you can be satisfied with, and you get to see the product. Like, let's go on a site and actually look at this building. Do you like this floor system? Oh, I didn't even know this existed. Exactly. This is within your budget. It'll look good. It has the color match that you're looking for. It has the durability, and it can provide the functionality that you're looking for for your building, for your space. So you save the money. You give them a good product, you know, and you help everybody out that way and John I, I think that when you as a good project manager when issues come up and money concerns if you work diligently to mitigate the cost implications of either problems or selections or whatever relationship wise when the owner sees that you're working on their behalf even though if it if the issue may be the owners to pay for but you manage to take it from ten thousand down to five thousand because eventually there will be the issue where you want the owner to pay so you don't have to. And if you've built that relationship and they know that you're working for them, and then they're more likely to help you. And, and, and that, that's the, the best way to handle the project. And it's also the best PR Absolutely. coming yeah. out of that project. Absolutely. It's yeah. very important for yeah. you and your company. Good question, 12 Corners. <laughs> Do you have another question for us, please? Oh. Hi, I'm Julius Bradley. Um, I also go to. Yep. Oh. Oh. Twelve corners. We you muted your microphone. You need to come back to us, please. That would be Kennedy. Okay. All right, uh, John F. Kennedy. Looks like we're with you right now. So until Twelve Corners comes back, let's see if you've got a couple questions for us, Kennedy.
Hi, I'm Larry Richardson. I'm